with the ancients. You can never, within an existentialist perspective, sit back and tick it off and say, well, then I'm a good, authentic person. Because of the nature that they construct action as a result of freedom, you can never, you can never get off the treadmill of choosing, of making choices. It's only when the final curtain goes down that can I stay with you to begin the discussion about the second sex? What's the big idea in that? So the second sex is often boiled down to two big ideas. You quoted you quoted one of them, that gender is constructed, the identity is constructed, and the other big idea is really dismantling this um, the operation and the dynamic of woman as other. Can we just start by gender is constructed? What do you mean by that? It's constructed. What did what did Bobo do? She about? she meant that existentialism, we have no nature, we have no human nature, we are free, we are totally not determined. So that there is a kind of philosophical rejection from the outset, gut rejection, of the idea that there might be an eternal femina, as the French call it, and you know, just like a woman, and female identity. So that our, we do not have gendered natures in the same way, we don't have any kind of nature. So, so we have no nature at all, nothing from our parents, nothing from the environment, nothing from the work situation, nothing from the imperatives of our life, but no, no, nothing there at all. Not in terms of something that you can say, this is why I act as I do. It's because of my background, it's because of my gender, it's because of my nationality. I'm acting in accordance with um, a pre-given script. And for Beauvoir and Sartre, there are no pre-given scripts. They are, um, he, 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 it was once to be existential, as well described as taking all logical consequences from atheism. So if there's no God, humanity, we are just born and we are there, and it is our being, um, the nature of consciousness and action that means that we will construct our path through the world. But sorry to be lumping about this, that's okay for the world world and, and, and Sartre sitting in the building and going in Paris with the last two of the philosophers and so on. But somebody born into a family where they, they well, a family where they have to earn a living and they have to, as it were, let's say, let's take it to a bit of an extreme, go down with the mines, that's the only work they can do. There's a lot prescribed for them and for women, but what they have to go into domestic service, earn a living. There's a lot prescribed. Too. Absolutely, and so, so that is the kind of, those are the, those are the kind of givens of one's situations, as you said, it's always in situation, being is not an, is not a free-floating autonomous thing, so it's what you do with the cards that you've been dealt. Oh sure, do you want to take this on? Um, yes, I mean, it is, it is about the situation. Bobas is encouraging women in the second sex to throw themselves into the world, to use a slightly Heideggerian phrase, and to seize their lives and to make their essence. So in a sense, when she's talking about not about becoming woman and not being born a woman, um, her point really is an anti-naturalist one, that there is no inherent nature that decrees that men are like this and women are like that. I completely understand that. It's not having the choices. It's, it's that the people can make all the choices. I don't but you can so you're born and, and it is society the patriarchy which says you have to be like that because you're a female that's right it's a uh, patriarchal ideology yes okay. um, so patriarchal ideology has certain what i would call the french would call myths about women okay there are also myths about men what was interested in women and those myths are act as determining forces for women in the world which right. constrain to behave in certain ways. Well, for example, the myth of motherhood, that motherhood is a natural situation that all women are destined to fulfill. Beauvoir argues controversially in the second sex that there is no maternal instinct and that the experience of real mothers on the ground, if I can put it in that way, um, is terribly variable. Um, in the same way that one could argue the experience of paternity is terribly variable as well. And this has to be learned rather than Exactly, and rather. this is something that in the second volume of The Second Sex, which is subtitled Lived Experience, indicating the phenomenological emphasis of the second volume, um, Beauvoir is uh, at pains to show the micropolitics of gender relations and the ways in which girls and women learn very quickly, both at conscious and unconscious levels, how to become women which can, who conform to patriarchal. So they become the second sex, the, the, the moon to the sun, the, the dark 
They become so. relative yes. to the masculine universal subject. That's right. And that's that what the second sex is. So that determines their their lives, the sexuality, everything about them. Well, it doesn't necessarily. <laughs> um, so Beauvoir's task is to dismantle some of these myths right. in the second sex and. Uh, in the second volume, she's saying, "Well, if we look at if we look at women's real experience, women are not predetermined in that way. Okay, that women do have choices, and it's also up to women to seize those choices. Um, because, and this is another kind of controversial area of the second sex. But why doesn't let women off the hook either? She looks at various ways that women respond to that situation, and sometimes the women are complicit with patriarchal ideology. How is this received, Christina? Christina Holmes." Well, it was received differently in different countries, differently, obviously, by different people. It was very popular. It seems to have been seen to be rather rude, in fact. And um, Beauvoir says that um, Moriac actually was very indignant and said that he didn't wish to know about the uh, workings of the author's vagina, which um, caused quite a, a scandalous um, reaction. I think that Beauvoir's quite explicit about bodily functions. So she talks about menstruation, for example, and abortion. Um, and what she writes is quite distasteful, I think, to, to uh, well, maybe it doesn't, maybe my colleagues don't find it distasteful, but she says, you know, that women smell and women get constipated, all to do with menstruation. It's quite extraordinary. It seems very old-fashioned now. But at the time, it was really rather revolutionary to be talking about it at all. Similarly, I think that something else I was liked in this book was the in which she um, talks about women without really talking about femininity. So she, particularly the Americans, found this difficult to deal with. They thought that you could be a feminist and feminine. But whereas both was equality from feminism, what I would say to move away from femininity. Watch out, roadworks reported on the road ahead. Feminism and herself as a feminist. And she also um, co-authored books to support Algerian women during the Algerian war. So I think feminism and women-centeredness is politically and intellectually very central to her work. Is there more to add, Ursula, if you did, <coughs> to how far she influenced feminist ideas, particularly this second breath, as it were, in the 60s, where we got tremendously in the way yes. in America and here. And can you just take that on? Yes, absolutely. Place? Yes. So Beauvoir was approached um, in a kind of flurry of radical activity around May 68. Beauvoir was approached by, by young feminists 
young Marxist feminists such as Christine Delphi and, and others. And they wanted both